Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first lecture in our course series, The Stars of Paris. Um, it's always such a lovely feeling to come back on the first day of any course. Um, and I'm so grateful for all of you um, to come and join and spend your afternoon with us. I do have to say, I talked to a couple um, attendees in line picking up their tickets. And they said they were so excited for the course starting again. And one of the people had recently been retired from the BPS school system for 35 years. So I just want to do a special shout out to her. I don't know who her, what her name is, but um, congratulations. And I'm so happy you can join us. <laughs> and thank you for your service. Um, and a huge special thank you to Wilmington Trust, who is generously sponsoring this course and the rest of the courses in 2019. It is very meaningful for us here at the museum. This course was, of course, inspired by the upcoming exhibition Toulouse-Lautrec and the Stars of Paris, which opens on April 7th and runs until August 4th. So this was designed to be a little bit of a prep course for that exhibition. Thank you so much for joining us here today, and please join me in welcoming Vanita Dada. Thank you. Good afternoon. And thank you for coming out on a snowy but sunny afternoon. Typical March Boston weather, right? OK, so I'm just going to get set up here with my water. And I know you won't mind if I switch glasses. I got new glasses recently, and I find that I can't read with them as well, so I have these readers now. So I just want to say that um, this invitation to talk at the MFA today about Toulouse-Lautrec made me very happy. I've been here a couple times before, and I had a great time. But this is special, because this poster that you're going to see in a second here, um, let's see. Uh, Kristen, are you here someplace? <laughs> ah, there we go. OK. So this poster sits above my computer at home. And I hasten to add, it's not the original, but a copy. <laughs> now, Wellesley College has the original, but I, some, for some reason, can't talk them into lending it to me. <laughs> at any rate, this is the famous publicity poster by Toulouse-Lautrec for La Revue Blanche, the White Review. And La Revue Blanche was an avant-garde literary journal which pay, played a key role in Parisian artistic and political life in the late 19th century. And it is, incidentally, the topic of my PhD dissertation, which I have to admit was a while ago, over 25 years. But Toulouse-Lautrec still feels like an old friend. And I wanted to start with this poster and then talk about how the vibrant Paris of Toulouse-Lautrec and his friends came about. So in this poster, all the elements of the new, exciting Paris inhabited and observed by Toulouse-Lautrec come together. First of all, it's an advertising poster for the journal. This poster. Excuse me, can you talk into the microphone? Sure. Is this better? Yes. OK. Sorry about that. I'm glad you told me. So this poster and others like it were plastered on buildings in Paris, but at the same time, the artists who created them were conscious of their posters being collector's items and offered them for sale to connoisseurs on that basis, thus collapsing the distinction between high and low culture, commercial and non-commercial art. La Revue Blanche in this poster, as you can see, was represented by an elegant, fashionable lady who ventured out going shopping, visiting friends, taking in the sights of the city. She was a symbol of the newly transformed Paris, a Paris which afforded women freedom and movement. Now Paris, according to German literary critic and sociologist Walter Benjamin, was the capital of the 19th century. What he meant by that was that Paris was not only the leading cultural and intellectual center, the birthplace of the avant-garde, and the capital of pleasure, but that it was also the most modern city in the world. Now, we Americans, 
tend to associate all that's modern with the United States. And that, of course, is true uh, for most of the 20th century. But during the years that preceded the First World War, what the French call the Belle Epoque, or the Beautiful Period, and those are the years going roughly from 1880 to 1914. So during this time, Paris was the capital of modernity, and it also became the capital of modern French life. It boasted the largest department store in the world, the Bon Marché. Uh, perhaps you visited it in Paris. Uh, and the Bon Marché easily eclipsed both Macy's and Marshall Fields. France also had the world's largest press, which sold 10 million copies daily on the eve of World War I, reaching one out of two adults. And that's really quite an impressive figure. Paris was also the home of the wide tree-lined boulevards, which housed shops, cafes, theaters, and all that we associate with modern life in the big city. Its Eiffel Tower, built in honor of the centennial of the French Revolution in 1889, was the tallest man-made structure in the world. It was a perfect symbol of the new modern Paris. Built in steel, it was a monument to the genius of French engineering and technology. And this is the Paris that became the major stop on Americans' world tours, like the Innocents Abroad by Mark Twain. And this is also the Paris immortalized in major American motion pictures, like Gigi, an American in Paris, and Funny Face, just to name three. And these films, a nostalgic nod to Paris of the past, have shaped most Americans' images of Paris, or perhaps most Americans of a certain age, including myself. Because I talked about these films in class a few weeks ago. I'm teaching a course this semester on Americans in Paris, and I think two out of 14 students had heard of these films. <laughs> so I'm trying to rectify it this uh, uh, lacuna, and uh, I have uh, sent them to go see the films. <laughs> so that's the Paris that we have in our heads. But what was Paris like before this transformation? Paris in the early to mid-19th century witnessed the first industrial revolution in France, the building of factories and railroads, as well as the establishment of the rudiments of a modern banking system. Paris, however, still remained a second-rate city, surprising visitors from London with its backwardness. It was dirty and insalubrious, with waste thrown into the Seine, which was also the source of drinking water. Although work on sewers was begun under Napoleon, the first Napoleon, not much was done until the second empire of Napoleon III. Uh, Napoleon III was the first Napoleon's nephew, um, and he was emperor of France from 1852 to 1870. So the sewers were begun in the mid-19th century, and some of them were not even done until 1900. Meanwhile, Cholera epidemics wiped out tens of thousands, with a major epidemic in 1832 killing more than 18,000 Parisians, mostly in poor areas. And so Paris remained, until the second half of the 19th century, a medieval city with dark, dangerous streets and warrens of houses, immortalized in novels like Eugène Sue's Les Mystères de Paris, The Mysteries of Paris, published from 1842 to 1843, and Victor Hugo's 1862 novel, Les Miserables. So picture Jean Valjean wandering these old streets. <laughs> Paris's population exploded from 759,000 to over a million from 1830 to 1846. That's, that's a huge jump. Most of the poor lived in dingy, overcrowded hovels and one couldn't travel from east to west or north to south because there were no big streets to get through. 
And Paris was essentially a series of little villages, so you'd be born in one part of Paris and often you never left it. People didn't go out to each other's houses. It was hard to get there. And they didn't go out at night, since the city was plunged in darkness and often dangerous. So in other words, the image we have of Paris as a city of light only came about after the transformation of Paris in the latter third of the 19th century. Also worth noting is that there was a mixture of social classes in Paris in the earlier 19th century, and often in the same buildings. The higher up one went, the poorer one was, and so you'd have the garret rooms right up top. The noble floors were the bottom ones, and in addition, many shopkeepers lived above their shops. You also had, at this time, a mixture of types of buildings on the same street. So you could find a modest wood and plaster home on the same block, maybe two doors down, from a much more elegant one in stone. And I'm going to show you this image. Uh, it is the Impasse de la Bouteille. It's in the second arrondissement, or the second district. And uh, this is a photograph by photographer Charles Marville. And since it's an, since it's an impasse, uh, obviously it's a dead end and you can't go anywhere, but you see how narrow this is. And um, Marville is a wonderful photographer, and he was hired to document the transformation of Paris uh, in his photos, and scholars remain divided about Marville um, and about the impact and intent of his work, with some saying that he celebrated an old Paris that would die out, and others saying that he encouraged, through his photographs, the urban reform movement that would destroy the old Paris. Now, I myself fall in neither camp. I think he was a photographer who was hired to do a job and who did it really quite beautifully and we're so lucky to have these photographs and I'll show you in a minute or two some more before pictures. So worth noting is that if there was less of a variety of housing in the same place in Paris, after the transformation of Paris, um, you did see a mix of different classes, social classes, out on the boulevards and a mixture of genders. But before this huge economic and social transformation could take place, one needed industrial production, which brought great wealth to the middle and upper classes, the development of a modern banking system to raise the capital required for all the works in Paris, and which also allowed for the establishment of department stores like the Bon Marché, which was founded at this time. And indeed, by the mid-19th century, the Bourse, which is France's Wall Street, was the biggest money market on the continent. And finally, you needed railways to move people and goods. But this industrialization also meant more people in the city and overcrowding. And it's at this point that Napoleon III, Napoleon's nephew, came to power in 1848 when he was elected president to the Second Republic in, eight, um, in 1848. So the French decided they would try this American presidential style system. It didn't work. In 1851, he effected a coup d'etat and established himself emperor for life, although he was forced to abdicate in 1870 after the French lost the Franco-Prussian War. Napoleon III had traveled extensively and had lived in London and he wanted to create a Paris that would rival London on the world stage. He also sought to rebuild and tribute to his own glory. Indeed, he saw the Roman Emperor Augustus as a role model. And I have to pause here to say that there's a long tradition of French leaders leaving their imprint on the city. So not only kings, who left us such royal squares as the Place Louis XV, which has now become Place de la Concorde, the Square of Harmony, the Square of Harmony because during the French Revolution it housed the guillotine. <laughs> so you've got these royal squares, but you also have Napoleon, who left us various monuments commemorating his great victories in battle, among them the Austerlitz Bridge and the Vendôme Column, as well as the Arc de Triomphe, 
completed in 1836. And even today, as you're walking around Paris and you look at some modern buildings, has anyone been to the Pompidou Center? Yes, okay, so this is the museum built by the former president of that name. And then you have the Opera of the Bastille and the new National Library, both of which were built by President François Mitterrand in the 1990s. So Napoleon III is part of a long French tradition. However, his restructuring of Paris was one of the largest urban renewal programs in the world. He and his chief architect, Baron Hausmann, and I'll show you a photo. Uh, that is Napoleon, who is uh, awarding Hausmann um, a decoration for services rendered to the state. Um, and so Napoleon III and Baron Hausmann, who wasn't really an architect but really a civil servant, transformed Paris, truly making it the capital of the 19th century. Now, since Napoleon III was an authoritarian ruler, he could affect change quickly and ruthlessly by appropriating buildings and land and partnering with private firms to build elegant houses and shops. And this, of course, drove up prices and pushed poor people out of the center of the city. And I'll have more to say about that in a bit. So what were the goals of Napoleon III and Haussmann? I have to tell you, I have trouble pronouncing that word because I'm a French professor, so I say Usman. So in English, I think it's Haussmann. First and foremost, they wanted the circulation of people, products, and air, movement to get rid of the congestion of the city. Napoleon III wanted Paris to become a cultural and economic capital, a place visited by provincials and foreigners. And as we said, Paris did become a major stop on world tours. There were also sociological reasons, linked to aesthetic and economic ones, to embellish Paris, and this meant moving poor people out into the other districts, or arrondissements. There are 20. There have been historically 20 um, uh, districts in Paris. So um, this process of transformation pushed poor people out to the 18th, 19th, and 20th in the northeastern part of Paris, so on the right bank, and the 13th and 15th on the left bank. And by the way, uh, Paris had 12 arrondissements or districts until 1860, when it expanded to 20 through the annexation of Auteuil, Passy, Grenelle, and other areas, including Montmartre. And I'll have quite a bit to say about Montmartre in a bit. So the process that we know as Haussmannization doubled the area of Paris, absorbing one half million inhabitants at this time. And finally, there were political reasons. Paris has historically been the center of the revolution. So you've got the revolution of 1789, that's the big one. Uh, then there's one in 1830, which established a constitutional monarchy. And then you have one in 1848, uh, when ironically, Napoleon III came to power. And the idea um, was that building the Grand Boulevards would make it easier to bring in troops and artillery to fight rebels. So in other words, it would be harder to erect barricades on the Grand Boulevards as opposed to the winding small streets like the little street you saw earlier. I'm gonna advance this here. So, um, we've got a map of Paris and I'll talk about this in a second. So Napoleon um, and Haussmann built an east-west access from the Place de la Nation on the east to the Etoile on the west, also building the avenues around the Etoile. And as you know, Etoile means star, and you've got all of the avenues that radiate out from it. Uh, and they also constructed a north-south access with the Boulevard Sébastopol, which cuts through the Ile de la Cité and becomes the Boulevard Saint-Michel on the left bank. Now, the most radical change took place on the Ile de la Cité, and that's the site of Notre Dame and it was also the site of some of the worst slums in Paris. 
In fact, there were hundreds of small shacks or hovels which stood in front of Notre Dame, so you couldn't see the cathedral. And I've always thought that this was a bit of private revenge on Haussmann's part. When he was a young man, he was a young law student, he would have to cross into this part of town, known for its slums, housing cutthroat thieves and prostitutes. Haussmann cleared out all the hovels in front of the cathedral, giving us the panoramic view that we have today. He also established the Ile de la Cité as an administrative center, housing law courts and police headquarters. So what better revenge could you get against criminals? You replace their own haunts, their old haunts, pardon me, with the machinery of the state and the law. And as you can see in this next image, you've got uh, the Quai des Orfèvres before and after. And um, the after picture, that is a picture of police headquarters. So as I said, I, I think he really had to have had that in mind and put the police headquarters here on purpose. So. Uh, at the same time, you've got architect Violet Le Duc, who was restoring Notre Dame. And the cathedral had been used as an arms depot during the French Revolution and was in bad shape. And there was even some talk of destroying it. And thank goodness it was not destroyed. Housemanization also involved building grand boulevards like the Avenue Arago, Magenta, Port Royal, Voltaire, Madeleine, and Haussmann. So there was even a Boulevard Haussmann, but the joke was that Haussmann was not able to finish it before the, um, uh, the Second Empire fell. So let me show you. Okay, so you see before and after. And uh, you can see all of the buildings that we associate with Haussmann's Paris, the elegant buildings, uh, as well as the trees. Um, and you always have a perspective that you're looking at. So Paris also witnessed the multiplication of green spaces. Napoleon III loved London parks, and he wanted to do the same thing in Paris. So you've got the construction of the Parc Monceau and the Parc Montsouris the Bois de Boulogne to the west, and the Bois de Vincennes to the east. And Haussmann also had trees planted to line the boulevards, and in some cases, they brought in fully grown trees and put them in. You also had a sewer system which was built, although it wasn't finished until the early 1900s. And in 1900, you also had the construction of the metro, the subway. Finally, you've got lamps. You've got 32,000 gas lamps that replaced 15,000 oil lanterns. And by 1877, electric lights supplanted the gas street lamps. And of course, Napoleon and Haussmann also authorized the construction of the uniform buildings that we associate with Paris on the new wide tree-lined boulevards. And I'm going to show you a painting, which I bet you know if you've been to the Art Institute in Chicago. It's one of my favorites. It's Guy Butts, The Rainy Day. And you see how all these streets come together and you have the sense of space. You also have the glistening uh, macadam sidewalks. You've got the Haussmannian buildings. And you've got elegant gentlemen and ladies walking in the city, which is something you really couldn't do before. So one of the crowning achievements of the new plan was the construction of the Opéra Garnier. This is the next one. There we go. Um, and this Opéra Garnier became part of the neighborhood associated with the new Paris and a destination for entertainment and shopping. And indeed, the process of Haussmannization pushed the city center to the west of the city. And one commentator noted, I'm quoting, this Place de l'Opéra, with its big ways that open onto everything, with these vast luxury stores, these gigantic cafes, the Grand Hotel and the Opera, this is modern Paris. So Napoleon III and Haussmann also connected the Louvre to the Tuileries Palace. And finally, 
they built railway stations like the Gare de Lyon and the Gare du Nord, thereby facilitating visits to the capital by foreigners and by provincials. Railway stations were a favorite subject of some of the painters of the time who liked to depict scenes of modern life. Manet is one of them. And in this slide, we have Monet's Gare Saint-Lazare. So you've got modernity in its glory in this image. I think it's hard for us to imagine, but Paris was a virtual construction site for 20 years. And the only thing I've ever seen like it is when I went to Shanghai almost 10 years ago. And my understanding is that maps were out of date from month to month because of the construction. So in my head, um, this is what it must have been like. Now, all these changes led to the tremendous growth of Paris. By 1870, the population stood at 2 million, and by 1914, 3 million. Now, the consequences of hospitalization were thus of great import. 20,000 houses were destroyed, among them some of historical importance and a number of them dating from the Middle Ages. And perhaps the most important consequence of this gentrification, and let's call it what it, it was, it was gentrification, um, was that it increasingly pushed the poor toward the outskirts of the city, especially toward those northeastern districts that I mentioned, the 18th, 19th, and 20th. And it's a process described brilliantly in various novels by Emile Zola, among them La Curé, and La Curé is translated as the kill. So in other words, Zola is using the language of the hunt to describe the process of speculation at this time. So we've got the kill, and he's also got La Sommoir, which translates into the dram shop, uh, in which one of the major characters, a washerwoman named Gervaise, wanders the new streets of her old neighborhood and feels alienated from a world where she no longer belongs. And I want to read you a short excerpt. Lost in the bustle of the wide footpath along the little plane trees, Gervaise felt alone and abandoned. And the open spaces of those avenues stretching away down there made her stomach turn. And to think that in all this flood of people, where there must be so many who were well off, there wasn't a single Christian soul to understand her and slip her a 10 sou piece. Yes, it was too big. It was too beautiful. Her head was spinning and her legs giving way under this endless surface of gray sky stretched out over such a vast space. I mean, it's really beautiful and poignant at the same time. And as Gervaise's experience illustrates, workers could no longer afford to live in the center of the city. While their wages went up by 30% during this time, rents and living expenses went up by 45%. So Haussmann and Napoleon III just displaced the problem of class conflict. And indeed, it was these workers feeling cheated and excluded by and from the new beautiful city who participated in the civil war known as the Commune, which took place in the wake of the French defeat in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, and which led to the abdication of Napoleon III. And I'd like to talk to you about that next, because um, the events of the Commune really transformed Paris. Excuse me. OK, so when Mark Twain visited Paris in 1867, he was much impressed by the modernity of Haussmannized Paris, and he even attended the 1867 Universal Exhibition held there to celebrate the achievements of Napoleon III. And I should say that when he was there, he went to the exhibition. He spent an hour there. Most of the time he spent there was gawking at Napoleon III and his entourage. If you haven't read Innocence Abroad, you really should. It's a lot of fun. So this is 1867. Then three years later, this glittering world would come tumbling down when Napoleon III was maneuvered, I would say outmaneuvered, by Prussian Chancellor Bismarck into declaring war. And that would lead to the fall of the Second Empire on September 4, 1870, 
after decisive loss at the Battle of Sudan on the eastern border. And the same day, on September 4th, the Third Republic was declared at City Hall. Now, if you've been to Paris, there's a small street called La Rue du 4 Septembre, the street of the 4th of September, and it commemorates the declaration of the Third Republic. And next time you go, check it out. All right, so the Third Republic, the dates, uh, you have them on your sheet, but I'll be happy to give them to you, 1870 to 1940. So it's the longest lived of the French republics, but it was born in defeat, the Franco-Prussian War, and it also ended in defeat, the arrival of the Nazis in 1940. So soon after the fall of the Second Empire and the Declaration of the Republic, later in September of 1870, the Prussians besieged Paris until the end of January 1871. And Paris at this time was unrecognizable. It was no longer the city of light, but plunged into darkness after rationing forced the government to limit gaslight. And one of the newspapers wondered, this lugubrious city without illuminated windows, open cafes, and gaiety. Is it still Paris? Good question. So gas lighting, which had extended the interior to the exterior and had literally fueled boulevard life, gave way to Paris in which boulevards with all their entertainments and cafes reverted back to streets used by pedestrians of all classes to get from one place to another rather than as a destination in an, of themselves. Various theaters around the city, including the Odeon Theater, became hospitals, and the Garnier Opera House became an arms depot. It's hard to imagine that beautiful building as a, an arms <laughs> depot, but it was. So many of the places of pleasure henceforth had utilitarian uses, and I'm going to show you this image by Isidore Pils, and you can see soldiers who are washing their clothes in a fountain at the Place Pigalle. So the fountain is no longer decorative, but quite um, useful for these soldiers. Elihu Washburn, the American minister to France, who was one of the few remaining foreigners in the city during the siege, spoke about the temporal and spatial anxiety of Parisians, or a suffocation due to a lack of food and light, and the simple feeling of being suspended in time and space. And if you get the chance, you should really read his writings. They're collected. And uh, also, there is the book by David McCullough, and he has an entire chapter on, on Elihu Washburn. So the Bois de Boulogne was no longer a park but rather a place for grazing animals, many of which were eaten by the end of the siege. Uh, that's when food became very scarce, except for Americans, because they knew about canned goods. So by December of 1870, food was so hard to find that Parisians were forced to eat the animals in the zoo, including Castor and Pollux, the famous elephants housed there. OK, it's going to get better. <laughs> or worse, depending. Um, indeed, some of the more chic restaurants featured menus such as this one. Um, and uh, if you read French, it lists stuffed head of donkey, elephant consomme, and roasted camel. And some Parisians extolled the virtues of rat pate and in the David McCullough book, he cites um, one commentator noticing the difference between brewery rat and a normal rat. I have to tell you, once you read those descriptions, you will become a vegetarian. <laughs> Promise. All right, so the siege of Paris came to an end by January 1871, after the Germans began using Krupp can cannons to blast their way through, and so Paris was forced to surrender. The French were forced to accept defeat, giving up the two provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, and to pay a hefty indemnity. Adding insult to injury, the Prussians, who had used the war as an excuse to unite the German states into a German empire, had Emperor Wilhelm I 
crowned at Versailles, the site of former French glory. That must have hurt. So when the new French government, which had alienated many Parisians, not only by capitulating to the Germans when many had wanted to continue fighting, but also by moving the capital from Paris to Versailles. Now, remember, Paris is the center of revolution. We talked about 1789, 1830, 1848. Versailles, of course, is associated with the monarchy. Um, so this government makes the people of Paris, especially the poor people of Paris, angry. And when the Versailles government, as it was known, sought to disarm the poorer sections of the city, notably Montmartre, which had raised money for cannons by public subscription, a skirmish broke out. And during the confrontation, combatants were killed on both sides. And instead of negotiating with the rebels, the leader of the Versailles government, a politician named Adolphe Thiers, besieged Paris once again. The result was a bloody civil war known as the Commune, in which more than 20,000 people were killed. And I know we always talk about all the people who died during the French Revolution and the terror and so forth. This number is greater than those who died during the terror. And another 50,000 people were sent into exile. The Communards were a disparate group of individuals. They wanted workers' rights, free education for all, and even women's rights. And their name uh, is a reference to the Commune of Paris. Now, the Commune is the smallest unit of government in France. And it's a reference specifically to the Commune of Paris, um, led by Danton uh, during the French Revolution, who had pushed back the Austrian invader. So obviously, the Commune had um, revolutionary associations and, and was happy to have those associations. Historians today see the events of the Commune in part as a revenge of the poor people pushed out by Haussmann's gentrification. And I'm going to come back to the subject of Montmartre in a bit because it was one of Toulouse-Lautrec's stomping grounds. The events of the Commune led to the destruction of key monuments after the Communards began a scorched earth policy as the Versailles troops made incursions into the city, setting the Tuileries Palace, symbol of royal power, on fire. And, okay, there you go. Um, it doesn't exist anymore, uh, but of course there's a subway uh, stop, right, marking the spot. Um, and actually it, um, it, looks, it doesn't look so bad in this picture, but the inside was a shambles. And uh, palace stood on those grounds for a while, and then it was eventually taken down. So the communards also burned parts of the Palais Royal, the royal palace, which housed a number of government ministries, right near the Louvre, thereby putting some of the paintings in danger. Um, and the communards also burned down the medieval city hall. So the structure that's the city hall today was built afterwards. And as a historian, I'll say how sad I, I am about that because um, the old city hall housed historical documents from the early 19th century. So those of my colleagues who work on the earlier period have a harder time because those records have disappeared. And they also toppled the Napoleonic statue on top of the Vendome column. And painter Gustave Courbet, responsible for this event, was later charged with paying restitution, and so ended his life in exile in Switzerland because he couldn't afford to pay. So you see this image. Here, it's the Napoleonic statue that was on top of the Vendome column, and he's dressed as a Roman em emperor. And you have communards all around. They toppled that statue. It was later put back up. Um, so the last big battle of the Civil War was in the Père Lachaise Cemetery. Has anyone been there? A few, yeah, it's off the beaten path, but it's really worth going there because of all of the tombs of famous French people. And for, for people who love rock, it, it, um, Jim, uh, Jim Morrison, exactly, exactly. Um, and I, my favorite is Oscar Wilde's tomb, which is covered with kisses. People go and kiss, you know, put on lipstick and then kiss the tomb. So 
anyway, uh, it all is also the site of the Civil War, uh, of the last battle of the Civil War. And um, so members of the commune had been hiding out among the tombs. And that battle ended in the execution of communards by the Versailles troops against the wall of the cemetery. And it was an event that took place during the last week of the insurrection in May of 1871. It's May 21st to 28th, and it's known for obvious reasons as Bloody Week. And this event has been marked in the collective memory of the left. I'm going to show you this slide. So even today, and this is a recent photo, communists and socialists make pilgrimages there in May, and they lay wreaths and flowers on the site. Um, so it's still a part of French memory of the left. So the communards were not without a sense of humor. They took revenge against Thiers, the French politician who ordered the siege of Paris, dismantling his house brick by brick. Here's a before picture, and look what they did to it afterwards. Um, so Thiers was not popular in Paris, and for many years there was no street in Paris named for him. Um, but there is one small one today, it dates from the early 20th century in the 16th arrondissement. But despite all this, Paris was resilient. By the end of 1871, Cook's Tours was organizing visits to Paris to see the ruins. And by 1875, when Henry James visited the city, it had returned to its former glory. And now we come to the Paris of the Belle Epoque, the beautiful period from 1880 to 1914, and that is the Paris of Toulouse-Lautrec. Now, one thing I want to say, and I say this to all my students who are in my Belle Epoque class, that the term is obviously retrospective and nostalgic. No one who lived there said, oh, yes, I live in the Belle Epoque. Um, <laughs> It was actually a term that dates from the beginning of World War II, so from about 1939 to the occupation. And I can imagine that for the French who were suffering from the occupation, the period from before World War I would seem beautiful and nostalgic. And I should also add that the period was not beautiful for everyone. Think about miners who work long hours or servants who work for uh, the people who were having a good time during the Belle Book. They worked long hours for little pay. However, for those who could afford it, the Paris of the Belle Book was the Paris of pleasures and entertainments, the center of the European avant-garde that we generally associate with Toulouse-Lautrec. A key law was passed in 1881 establishing freedom of the press, and this law, along with improvements in technology, particularly in the production of newspapers and images, led to the emergence of a mass press and with it, national opinion. And you have this image. It's by Swiss artist Félix Vallotton. It's called The Age of Paper. And so what do you see? You don't see anybody's faces. You see uh, a group of men, uh, upper class men with their nice hats, and um, they're reading newspapers. Um, and they're reading in a cafe. And that's a public democratic space as opposed to the private aristocratic space of the salons. So anyone can go to a cafe for the price of a drink. And they are reading, actually, different newspapers which are actually talking to each other, creating a sense of national community. Now, the Republicans, and with a little r, of course, who had seized power in 1870, also undertook huge projects to build roads and construct railways. And, and constructing railways and roads facilitated the process of moving goods, including newspapers, thereby creating a national economy. The department store, which I mentioned earlier, was rather like the Republican schools founded at this time because it was a process of homogenization. So while schools forged a national identity around patriotism and the speaking of French, and I'll pause here to tell you that 25% of French people did not speak French in 1850. 
They spoke local dialects, especially in Brittany and in the south in Provence. And so one way of creating national unity was by creating these compulsory schools where people, where, where young kids, were forced to speak French. So you've got that homogenization through the schools, and then you've got the department stores as well. What they do is teach members of the more modest classes how to dress and how to furnish their houses, like members of the upper bourgeoisie. And you have a drawing here of the Bon Marché, which, as I said earlier, was the largest department store in the world. And just to get an idea of how big it was, it sent out one and a half million catalogs per year all over the world. One and a half million is very large. Um, so this Belle Epoque period thus marked not only the emergence of mass democracy, but also of mass culture, both of which had a leveling effect on French society. Now the pillars of this mass culture were the penny press, the boulevard theater, and the cafe buttressed by the department store. All of these institutions were not only housed on the boulevards, together they created the new boulevard culture which privileged the visual, seeing and being seen, and turned all of Paris into what one historian has called a city of spectacular realities. That is, everyday events turned into public entertainment. Everything from visits to the morgue, uh, and I know that's gruesome, but people did go to the morgue. Um, Madame Tussauds Wax Museum, even watching a dentist pulling a patient's teeth in the street. That also does not sound like fun, especially for the person whose teeth is, are, are being pulled. So one author of this time said, the boulevards are not only the heart and head of Paris, but also the soul of the entire world. I have to stop there and say that that's very French, the French thinking that Paris is the center of the world. Um, I can't tell you how many quotes I have like that, including one from Victor Hugo. So the Belle Book period witnessed the flourishing of popular entertainments, among them cabarets and music halls, the subject of a number of Toulouse-Lautrec works, and more about that in a minute, and even the colonies became a source of visual consumption as the public visited recreations of African villages, an Algerian Kasbah, the model of the Cambodian Angkor Wat temple at the World's Fairs. And I'm going to show you, this is the Algerian Kasbah from the 1889 World's Fair. So you've got World's Fairs in 1889 and 1900, which attracted 30 million and 50 million visitors, respectively. And the record for the, for the most number of people at a World's Fair um, after 1900 was Expo 67, so 1967 in Montreal. So for the 1889 World's Fair, as we saw earlier, the Eiffel Tower was constructed, becoming the tallest structure in the world, although a visiting Thomas Edison would eye it and claim that Americans soon would do the French one better. And that's very American. If the other thing was very French, this is American. So here I have two different slides. You've got on the one side, you've got Eiffel on top of his tower, and then a panoramic view from the Eiffel Tower. So the tower was an ode to progress and technology, and while its inventor, Eiffel, thought it beautiful, a number of conservative artists and writers did not, calling it a bad Yankee dream. <laughs> Among them, writer Guy de Maupassant, who claimed that he liked climbing the tower because it was the only place in Paris where he couldn't see it. Fun guy. So for the 1900 World's Fair, uh, there were such iconic buildings as the Grand Palais, which you see here, it was built. And then the Petit Palais here. 
And if you're interested, Thomas Edison filmed um, scenes from the 1900 World's Fair, and you can find uh, you can find the clip on YouTube. It's a lot of fun. Also, my favorite bit, bridge in Paris. I don't know if you have a favorite bridge, but I do. Mine is uh, the Pont Alexandre III. It's that Baroque gold bridge, uh, Alexander III bridge. And that was also constructed at this time, and it was to commemorate the Franco-Russian Friendship Treaty of 1896. So, consumption. Visual and otherwise also took place on the Grand Boulevards, where the major newspapers were housed, next to cafes, and indeed newspaper offices contain their own cafes where members of the public could read newspapers. As for the cafe, it was a prime spot for people watching, and some contemporaries likened this experience to the entertainment of the theater. And similarly, the glittering shop windows of the department store offered spectacles for sale. As an American visitor to Paris noted of the department store, it's as good as a play to stand at the window of this shop and watch people inside. So this visitor doesn't even have to pay to, uh, to get something out of the, um, the department store. The Belle Epoque was not only the golden age of the press, but also of the Boulevard Theater. And these two institutions worked in symbiosis. The newspapers advertised the latest plays and highlighted the smallest details of famous actors and actresses' lives. And I'm here to tell you that People magazine did not invent anything new. <laughs> so this is the beginning of the age of celebrity culture. And that's a topic that you'll be exploring next week with my friend, Professor Catherine Clark. But I do want to say one or two things about it. Um, actress Sarah Bernhardt who regularly played to sell out audiences, portrayed national heroes like Joan of Arc, whom she portrayed two different times, uh, the second time when she was well over 60. I know, I'm really impressed. So she would get on stage and say, I am a young maid of 19, and everybody would clap, and she'd bring the whole house down. <laughs> so in this image, she's, all, she's playing Napoleon's doomed son, uh, the eaglet father being the eagle. Um, and Napoleon's son died of tuberculosis in exile at the age of 21. But perhaps the greatest theatrical success of the Belle Epoque was Edmond Rostand's Cyrano de Bergerac, with the great actor Coquelin portraying the lead role. This play celebrated its 1,000th performance in 1913 and made its author a national hero and the first celebrity author. So my students could relate to this. I said, well, he's the J.K. Rowling of his time. <laughs> and, and they got it. <laughs> so the theater was a place for crafting heroes and forging national identity. The French public, weary of political quarrels, disheartened by a lack of glory, due to the loss in the Franco-Prussian War, and fearful of technological, cultural, and social changes, including the rise of the women's movement, the rise of the socialist movement, um, they increasingly sought refuge in the fictions of the theater and the press. The theater, as we've seen, often presented historical heroes like Napoleon and Joan of Arc. And as for the press, it promoted both real life and fictional heroes. Real life heroes in the sensational news stories that it published above the fold, and fictional ones in the serialized stories published below the fold. So, this is um, the golden age of the theater in every sense of the term. Um, and as you know, um, Toulouse Lautrec depicted many scenes in the theater. And as one historian has written, Paris during the Belle Epoque was a stage a vast theater for herself and all the world. And what he meant was not only the role the theater played in French national life at the time, but also to the theatricality of Belle Epoque life. And this painting by Jean Béraud is unfortunately in a private collection. I really like it because it depicts the theater. It's the Théâtre des Variétés. 
And it's a typical Parisian scene of the time. You see the uh, Morris column, the Colonne Maurice, which contains advertisements. You've got men and women milling in the street and basically enjoying the life of the city. And then I'm going to show you this one. Um, which you probably know. And this is uh, the Boulevard Montmartre by Pissarro. And again, you see the boulevard, you see the omnibuses, you see the trees, the Haussmannian buildings, people bustling around and in general enjoying the life of the city, even in their daily activities. So the theatricality of life at this time isn't limited to the theater and to performances in the theater, but also to politics. In the 1890s, Paris was the site of many bombings by self-styled anarchists, one of which was thrown into the Chamber of Deputies, and that's the lower house of parliament, and another at the cafe of a busy railroad station. And it all ended in the assassination of President Sadi Carnot in 1894. So this is a time of political and social unrest with the rise of minor strikes in 1880, uh, in the 1880s, pardon me, in the 1890s. And remember, these were folks who were working long hours for little pay, no protection. And a lot of their strikes were defensive strikes to have their wages kept the same and not cut. Um, and it was also marked by one of the greatest of French conflicts, an event that remains imprinted in French memory even today, and I'm talking about the Dreyfus Affair. Um, have you heard of the Dreyfus Affair? Yes? Okay, good. Um, it's the subject of an entire talk, and since I wrote my first book on the Dreyfus Affair, I've talked about it quite a lot, and I don't have that much time, but I do want to touch upon it today. So uh, the broad outlines. In 1894, a German, uh, a Jewish, sorry, army captain was accused of selling secrets to the Germans and sentenced to life imprisonment on Devil's Island in French Guiana. Subsequently, his family and friends found out that he'd been falsely accused and that there'd been a military cover-up. This one court case, a military court case, became a huge affair of national opinion centered less on the guilt or innocence of one man, but rather a debate about the nature of French identity itself. So was the true France a modern industrial society, the country of the French Revolution, which had granted equal rights to Jews, or was it a rural and path, uh, pastoral Catholic nation in which reason of state triumphed over the violation of an individual's rights. The affair divided friends and families and it pitted, for the most part, the conservative forces of the church and the army against more progressive Republican ones. It's more complicated than that. And as I said, in my first book, I spent a lot of time complicating the story. Uh, <laughs> because that's what we do as historians. So I wanted to indicate in that book how porous the two groups were, and not just monolithic blocks. But it's absolutely true that those are the broad outlines that I've sketched out. So the affair was in large part propelled by the press, as we saw in that Valoton image earlier of men reading newspapers in the cafe. In fact, the affair was the first event of the mass media in France, so unimaginable without having a national press because it was, the whole debate was carried out in the press. And incidentally, you also need a public that can read, and we talked about those Republican schools earlier. As for Toulouse-Lautrec's role in all this, um, it's true that he had made some anti-Semitic caricatures in common with many of his colleagues at this time. Nevertheless, Toulouse-Lautrec was closely associated with the avant-garde journal La Revue Blanche, the white review with which I began my talk. And unlike his mentor, Edgar Degas, Toulouse-Lautrec didn't break from his friends at the journal, whose editors were Jewish and most of whom were fervent partisans of Dreyfus. But it's fair to say that the affair would divide artists and writers. So you've got Degas, Cézanne, Renoir, 
who are all against Dreyfus, anti-Dreyfusards, while Monet, Pissarro, Vuillard, Bonnard, the latter two who were associated with La Revue Blanche, they were pro-Dreyfus, Dreyfusa. So Montmartre was the focus of some of the political and cultural effervescence of the time. It was both a place of pleasure and crime, and it also had revolutionary associations. Remember that the events of the Commune began here. Montmartre was a working class district in which bohemian writers and artists rubbed shoulders with anarchists, criminals, and prostitutes. While Montmartre was annexed into Paris in 1860, and we talked about that earlier, it was still far enough away from the center of Paris to seem like a village. It also had not been transformed by the process of hospitalization. You had um, windmills that dotted the landscape and it still felt like you were in the country. Rents were also cheaper here and it became a haven for artists like Toulouse-Lautrec who had their studios here. And actually Toulouse-Lautrec came to Paris in 1882 and he studied with an artist called Louis Bonin and Louis Bonin had his um, studio here. So in 1880, a law was passed prohibiting the closing of any cafe for political reasons, leading to the growth of numerous cabarets, dance halls, and drinking establishments. As you may know, the Moulin Rouge, the site of the scandalous Cancan, was founded here in 1889. And I wanted to show you this painting. It's at the Moulin Rouge by Toulouse-Lautrec. And in this image, we see prostitutes, we see performers who come here, uh, and, then, and, and you also have bourgeois men who are in attendance to find their pleasures. And in fact, members of the upper classes came here, they were slumming, uh, and one of them happened to be the Prince of Wales. <laughs> the one from way back when, not the current one. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to make that clear. So one of the most famous cabarets in Montmartre was Le Chat Noir, or the Black Cat. And here, you must know this poster, right, by Steinlin. And uh, the Black Cat was a symbol of sexuality and of danger. And it was a cabaret, and it also had its own newspapers. And uh, it was founded by a man named Rodolphe Salis. And he was quite a character. His guests or clients were either greeted with insults, like, when'd you get out of prison? Or, where's the girl you were with the last time you were here? <laughs> or exaggerated politeness. He had a man in a Swiss guard costume greet his guests like royalty. On one occasion, he announced his own death and held a wake for himself at his cabaret. Salis invited young bohemian artists to hang their paintings in his establishment and singers like Aristide Bruant to perform, but Salis often exploited them. Now, Bruant eventually defected from Le Chat Noir and founded his own cabaret, Le Mirliton. And you might recognize him from this poster by Toulouse-Lautrec, right? So there you have Bruant. You note his iconic uh, red scarf, uh, his hat, and his cape. So um, both Salis and Bruin, and Bruin sang songs that talked about the downtrodden and the poor. Um, but, and they saw themselves as, an outs as outsiders, opponents of the establishment and of the bourgeoisie. But the irony of these bohemians was that in seeking to escape the commercial culture of the bourgeoisie, they availed themselves of advertising and publicity techniques for self-promotion. In the case of Bruant and Salis, they grew rich from their counterculture exploits, with Bruant buying a country estate to which he retired, living the good life until his death at age 73. Now, I should say that these two men were exceptions. A lot of the bohemian artists of Montmartre were poor and down and out and died poor. So you've got the Montmartre of cabarets, but you also have 
the iconic Sacré-Cœur Church, which was built by Catholics to expiate the crimes and national divisions of the commune. You see um, the church under construction. Montmartre was also reputed to be the site of the martyrdom of France's patron saint, Saint-Denis. Construction of the Sacré-Cœur, which began in 1875, was not completed until 1914, and the church was not consecrated until 1919, so after World War I. The irony of its location was not lost on the denizens of Montmartre cabarets, who mocked the religious pilgrims who henceforth flocked the site, rubbing shoulders with disabused Montmartre bohemians. So it's this Paris uh, that's the capital of the 19th century to which tourists flocked and which became a symbol of French modernity. And I want to leave you with this last image of Paris. And this is a photograph by Eugène Atje from 1912. And it depicts Par Parisians at the Place de la Bastille looking at the solar eclipse. Um, Wellesley College is really lucky to have this photograph, and they did an exhibition of their photographs a few years ago and asked me to pick any one out of their collection to talk about it. And I chose this one, and I hope you'll see why. Anticipating total darkness, city leaders had ordered the gas lamps lit, adding to the eerie glow of the city. Enterprising young hawkers selling dark glass discs registered record sales while the manufacturer Bernot distributed them free of charge, thereby gaining a lot of publicity for himself. Tourists flocked to Paris by the thousands, and their numbers swelled the socially diverse crowds that congregated, as in this photo, on Parisian squares, rooftops, cafe terraces, and unencumbered spaces offering large vistas. So Atje also gives us a snapshot of the era portraying the vibrant life of the city and the shared community of its inhabitants, illustrated by the diversity of ages, genders, and classes. So you notice the respectable bourgeois lady. There is a young girl. You've got shop workers who are identifiable by their uh, white coats. And you've got middle class men identifiable by their bowler hats. And one. Uh, of the people there is holding a newspaper, which helped to forge a national community and was an emblem of the age. The Paris of the Belle Époque, the Paris of Toulouse-Lautrec, was a place to see and be seen. The recently urbanized capital had been transformed into a vast stage, which not only afforded nightly entertainments in the theaters, cabarets, and dance halls depicted by Toulouse-Lautrec, but also in the everyday spectacles of daily modern life, from the shop windows on the tree-lined boulevards to the cafes of major hotels where spectators could watch passers-by. The way of life symbolized by these pleasure seekers of the Belle Époque was to survive just another two years, only to disappear in the trenches of the First World War. Thank you. We have microphones on either side of the room if you have any questions for Vanita today. And I'm going to switch glasses now so I can see you. Oh. I'm sorry. Could you explain again um, how the commune, the Civil War of the commune ended? What happened to Louis the... Uh, Napoleon III and sure. Adolphe Thiers. Sure, okay, so Napoleon III abdicated in the middle of the Franco-Prussian War on September 4th, 1870. Um, and he, so he was off the national stage. You had a declaration of a republic and, uh, the, and then a government that negotiated with the Germans um, and a government uh, that then signed a treaty making Parisians, many of whom were workers, 
and who were very patriotic and who wanted to continue fighting angry. Um, and that government also moved the seat of government from Paris to Versailles, which is a symbol of royal power. And what that government tried to do was try to disarm various parts of Paris that were the poorer sections of Paris, and Montmartre being one of them. The problem was when they were trying to um, disarm the people, they got mad because they had actually paid for those cannons and they saw, saw them as theirs. So skirmishes broke out, there was violence, there, was, there were dead people on both sides. And the problem is this, is that the uh, French leader at the time, uh, uh, Thiers, he should have negotiated with them. He decided he was uh, a military guy and he, he wanted to have another siege. So he besieged Paris again, so against his own people. And the communards, they're really a disparate group of people. Um, are, some are working class, some are artisans. It's really hard to say that they're working class in the way that we understand today because France wasn't really fully industrialized at the time. But you've got a, a group of people, many of whom were pushed out of Paris by Haussmann and really felt left out. And in some ways, it's a revenge. That's what historians think. And I didn't mention this in my talk, but some also think of this as a big party, <laughs> the carnival, so being in charge of all of these buildings. Um, but obviously, it was a very violent incident, and it is um, a civil war in which more people die than in the French Revolution, and we always think of the French Revolution. Um, and it left its mark on Paris because you've got all these buildings that don't exist anymore. That, is that? Um, and then did, did the, when did the Versailles government mm -hmm. kind of get back to the uh, Back to Paris. Well, I didn't want to bore you with a lot of political history. Um, and, I, and I do talk about it when I teach this in my classes. But basically what happened at the beginning of the Third Republic, um, the people in power are not really Republican. They, they just say, OK, we'll go along with the Republic, and then we'll blame the Republic for signing this treaty with, with the Germans. And so most of them are conservative types. They're monarchists or they're Bonapartists you know, for, uh, for Napoleon III. Um, what happens is finally, um, by 1879, you have elections and Republicans take, place, uh, take power in both houses of parliament. But that's a process that takes some time. You're welcome. I, I think, Kristen, there's someone, there's a gentleman up here. Oh, there's, sorry, there's someone on the microphone. She's standing right here in the middle. Sure. Hi. Uh, ever Hi. Since, ever since reading uh, Robert Caro's biography of uh, Moses mm -hmm. uh, in New York, uh, I have never been able to shake the uh, comparison between him and, and the work that he did and that of Baron Hausmann. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, I, do you want me to ask a more specific question than that, or have I already gotten you thinking about the parallels and would you share your uh, you, opinion? You, maybe, maybe you could ask me a more specific well, question. Well, uh, I think that at this point in time, uh, Mos uh, Robert Moses mm -hmm. is perceived as mm -hmm. uh, in balance, on balance, not necessarily having been such a great thing. Uh, on the other hand, I, I don't hear that much criticism about Baron Hausman. I mean, yes, of course, he forced uh, poorer people mm -hmm. out of the city, uh, but the city is, was transformed. It really did become the city of light and a place that uh, tourists mm -hmm. uh, still flock to to this very day. On balance? Well, you know, it, it's, it's tough. Because I'm a historian, I'm not going <laughs> to say I think one thing or the other. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right that it is this beautiful city um, that we admire today. And, and he really got rid of disease. Uh, um, and, and crime in many ways. But I think we're still living with the effects of pushing poor people out into the suburbs. If you think about the banlieue, the suburbs outside of Paris, 
uh, today. The other thing is, it depends on who you read. Um, I'm teaching this course that I mentioned earlier on Americans in Paris with a colleague, and um, my colleague had students read art historian T.J. Clark on hospitalization, and he's a left-wing historian. He cites all of the critique of the destruction of an old Paris where people knew their neighbors and they lived right where they worked. And so the emphasis was very much on this nostalgic Paris. So I, it, it depends on who you read. Um, if you really push me on balance, it probably um, made Paris the kind of city that we want to go to today, so. Yeah. Um, you, when you mentioned uh, the cholera epidemics mm -hmm. in, in, in Paris, and um, it kind of related it to the sewers, mm -hmm. and it reminded me of what was happening in London mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of the Thames and cholera, and the, and the fact that it took uh, Londoners are a really long time to figure out that it was water. Exactly. And not miasma and all that. Right. Was the same thing happening in Paris? Was there any um, sharing of information between the two cities or was... You know, I don't know of any sharing of information, but it, it was the same miasma theory and not realizing that it had to do with water. Um, and even in 1900, so you've got that World's Fair is supposed to be celebrating French progress. People were dying in poor parts of Paris, even in 1900, because of the cholera, until they finished all of that sewer work. Um, so I'm thinking that maybe they didn't do a lot of sharing of information. Okay. Yeah. Can you say more about Toulouse-Lautrec and his um, anti-Semitic remarks, and whether it, did he evolve to not be, you know, an anti-Semite? Well, here's here's the thing: is if you look at a lot of the sketches from this period, including from artists like Pissarro, who went on to defend Dreyfus, there are a lot of anti-Semitic tropes in them, um, because um, if you were on the left criticizing um, wealthy bankers was linked to anti-Semitism. That was your kind of shorthand. Um, and it was, it was really common currency at the time in a way that you know, we find shocking today. Um, what happened in the affair is that those on the left who expressed such anti-Semitic views, including Emile Zola, and he is the big defender of Dreyfus, um, they moved away from that. And so anti-Semitism was increasingly adopted by the right. Now, Toulouse-Lautrec is an interesting figure because while a lot of his colleagues at the Revue Blanche, the, the journal that was founded by um, two young uh, men of, of who, whose parents were Polish and who were uh, French and Jewish, um, they, all of those, uh, the writers and artists associated with the journal were very much engaged in the Dreyfus Affair and engaged in fighting anti-Semitism and signed petitions and, and went to meetings. And Toulouse-Lautrec doesn't, he doesn't really appear on any of the petitions or, or any of the documents. And part of it, I think, has to do with he comes from an aristocratic background um, where anti-Semitism was common currency. But at the same time, if he doesn't say anything in public about it, um, he's also he's showing by, by still maintaining his friendships with the uh, writers and the founders of the Revue Blanche um, that, he, that he is on their, uh, on some way, in some ways, on, on their side. But uh, as I said, anti-Semitic caricatures abound in the art of this time. Um, I've um, heard that the commune is one of the least digested elements of French political history. Mm -hmm. uh, are there echo, <coughs> excuse me, echoes of it in the yellow vest phenomenon? Wow, that's a that that's a, a good question. I think it would take me a long time to answer it, but I can I can start. Um, you know, the thing about the yellow vest phenomenon is that there are some people who are urban, but it's also a rural phenomenon. But, it, but there is the element of those folks in rural areas that have been left behind, um, who no longer have any hospitals or schools, and who feel really excluded 
from um, the world of what they would see as elite politics and represented by President Macron, who, who, um, who was the economic minister. So I think there are elements of that. Um, there, and, but you've got folks from the left and folks from the right, and increasingly you also have anti-Semitism among some of the members of the Yellow Vest. So um, I'm not sure there, you, you could say it's exactly the same, but I see certain parallels, um, especially this idea of being excluded from the wealth of the country. You're welcome. Thank you so much for coming today, and thank you to Vanita for a wonderful lecture. Thank you for coming.